Hi, everyone. Sorry, just walking back from the library. I'll be back in my office in one second. Is it recording? Looks like it, yeah. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Um, should I start? I'm not sure if Professor Raskin is talking still. I'm here. I just want to make sure that Amy, can you hit record? Because you're the host now. I'm not the host anymore. It oh, says yeah. it's recording. It's recording? I can see that it's recording in the top left for me. It is. OK, great. Fantastic. All right, thank you. Go ahead. OK, perfect. So hi, everyone. Um, today, I'm going to be presenting on the research that I conducted this summer on early maternal loss as a form of trauma. So during early stages of life, the parent-child relationship is a very unique bond in which the child found, has a foundation to grow and develop. Um, and when this relationship is disrupted, for example, through adverse childhood experiences, um, there can be altered psychopathology in later life. Um, so I specifically looked at the relationship between maternal separation and long-term behavior across um, dogs, cats, and horses to draw insights into human psychopathology. So um, to start, I think it's important to acknowledge the early pioneers of attachment theory and to, and to understand the genesis of this theory and how it relates to 20th century ethological frameworks. So um, John Bowlby's seminal recognition that traumatic disruption of infant caregiver bond increases the risk of psychopathology has transformed um, this field of psychoanalysis. Um, this work was complemented by the work of Mary Ainsworth that illuminated how early emotional bonds um, influence long-term psychopathology, and Ainsworth's focus on individual differences um, in infant attachment and focus for researchers has mainly been on the cognitive precursors and outcomes of these differences um, strictly in humans. Next, um, Conlad Renz, um, you know, in contrast to mainstream psychoanalytic formulations during this time, Bowlby, Bowlby sought out um, biological models to strengthen his theories. And um, in the pre-war years, he consulted with Conrad Lorenz, um, a leader in the emerging field of ethology. And um, next, among Tim Bergen's greatest contributions was his emphasis on understanding the evolutionary and adaptive benefits of behavior um, and its phylogenetic roots. Um, and the influence of this conceptual framework was found throughout Bowlby's post-war writing. And lastly, um, Bowlby's association with Robert Hind also provided a framework for his emerging hypotheses. Um, as awareness of psychopathology and other species increases, the animal basis of Bowlby's theoretical framework takes on a new salience for um, human mental health. So moving on to the methods of um, this literary review, so um, it was a review of veterinary literature uh, to identify the similarities and differences in the impact of maternal loss in the domestic cats, dogs, and horses. And um, we used both qualitative and quantitative analyses of how age at weaning impacts the risk of psychopathology. And we identified similar responses to maternal loss um, in these specific species. And um, as you can see here, these were kind of like the key terms searched and we used um, a bunch of different um, databases. And the hypothesis um, was that early maternal loss in the three species is associated with the neurodevelopmental pathways, setting the stage for attachment associated psychopathology in later life. So just quickly um, to touch on the importance of this kind of research, um, comparative psychopathology is an emerging field of relevance for human mental health professionals. And more recently, there's been mounting evidence for veterinary literature that supports the existence of a panmammalian commonality um, in response to traumatic maternal separation. Additionally, there are comparative studies that identify similar periods of de developmental vulnerability um, to attachment disorder. And in addition, there are similar forms of early adversity from premature maternal separation to neglect that are linked to mental health consequences in later life. 
And lastly, um, as such, this is an opportunity that has emerged to understand the behavioral components of attachment in humans through a comparative lens by drawing explicit connections to other species. So um, during this research, we kind of combined all the literature and the results, and I created this sort of diagram to make it easier to digest. Um, so this basically shows uh, the potential pan species patterns and associations between maternal separation and psychopathology. Um, and you know, it's a species spanning model that highlighted the downstream consequences of maternal separation early life. So um, to start on the human side, data supports a strong correlation between maternal separation and risk of adult psychopathology. And, the, and as you can see, um, the first six years of maternal child relationship is very critical to the behavior development of the child. Um, studies have shown that disruption before six years of age has led to socio-emotional development problems, mental health problems, lower reading achievement, um, and disruption to the family system. So Bowlby proposed that attachment takes place during a critical period of two and a half years, but later revised it to suggest that attachment can still form up to up to five years. Um, and recently, literature suggests that the first two years of life are sensitive periods for parental shaping. So moving on to um, the puppies. So for puppies, artificial weaning um, occurred between one to seven weeks of life, while natural weaning occurred at eight weeks. Um, in kittens, the natural weaning period occurred at six weeks. Um, and you know, in cats, undesirable behaviors have been linked to maternal separation prior to the six weeks, um, which was the age of natural weaning. And lastly, um, the natural weaning period in foals occurred between eight to 10 months of age, and studies showed that artificial weaning um, occurred from four to seven months of age. So in horses, um, maternal separation before the eight to 10 months was associated with um, undesirable behaviors, which I will get into in the next slide. So um, we were able to document the behavioral consequences of maternal separation and artificial weaning according to the existing veterinary literature. And to start with the puppies, um, separating the pup from the mother during the period of artificial weaning um, may lead to excessive barking and vocalizations, fearful and destructive behavior, restlessness, increased aggression, sensory sensitivity, and separation anxiety. In cats, um, studies showed that artificial weaning before the natural period resulted in separation anxiety, vocalizations, inappropriate behavior, and aggression. And finally, um, separating a foal from the dam results in fearful behavior, separation anxiety, sensory sensitivity, aggression, vocalization, and inappropriate behavior. So kind of to conclude, um, I think what the insights that we got from my research was that adverse events such as weaning and separation were indeed associated with an increase in psychopathology and biobehavioral disorders across all three species, um, despite the general breed specific variation in the age of natural weaning. And this is consistent with the modern understanding of the downstream effects of early separation from an attachment figure in humans and parallel um, and sorry, and additionally, finding um, for all these species fit into the human framework, linking ACEs such as neglect, abuse, violence, and separation to poor well being, various health complications, um, and exacerbated psychopathology in later life. And lastly, our results do support um, the hypothesis that across the three species studied, early maternal loss activates neurodevelopmental pathways setting the stage for attachment associated psychopathology. Um, additionally, dogs, cats, and horses, and humans share common mammalian ancestry with overlapping neuroanatomical, physiological, and mechanistic processes related to attachment. And that psychopathology um, rooted in maternal loss in other animal species offers a rich source of insights into the nature of developmental, environmental, and genomic factors leading to the human attachment disorder. And lastly, I just have a couple discussing discussion questions. That was great. I love the figures. I thought those were super helpful, um, really interesting. So um, again, people can can maybe jot these down and think about them if we have time. But um, I want to make sure everyone has time to go. So I don't know who wants to go next.
I can go next. Thank you. Any other comments for Jessica before we go on? All right, go ahead, Karen. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. So today I will be presenting on neuroscience in the prison system. This topic is important because oftentimes we forget about those who are incarcerated and they are seen as outsiders and are dehumanized. There's an overlap with this population in neuroscience. Some of the content that I will discuss may be triggering. First, a woman from York once said, all prison sentences are life sentences because the effect of prison never leaves a person. The prison population is made up of 2.3 million people within the United States and 10.35 million people throughout the world. Black people make up 40% of the prison population within the United States, while whites make up 57%, Native Americans 2%, Asians 1%. Recently, women have experienced higher rates of incarceration than men and socioeconomic status heavily influences the prison population. Kanavs et al. 2010 study says that prison usually come, prisoners usually come from disadvantaged backgrounds and they have limited access to adequate mental health services. Due to the lack of access to these services, one in four people incarcerated re-enter the prison system when released. It is important that to note that 10 million people are affected by the prison system because of the connection they may have to the people that are incarcerated. Neurocognitive impairment is essential to well being and successful integration. For the prison population, it is often overlooked. 75% of inmates in New South Wales suffered from mental health issues, 50% of inmates had ADHD as children, and half meet the criteria as adults. Of the 1,532 inmates, 74% had at least one diagnosis of psychiatric disorders. 82% of inmates report past of traumatic brain injury. They often struggle with executive functioning, verbal learning and memory, and verbal working memory. Inmates, experience, uh, inmates experiences affect their neurobiology causing aggression, trauma, and confinement to name a few. Research in social, science, social neuroscience has shown that stimulating environments can result in better executive functioning of the brain and more advanced social cognitive and social learning and less impulsivity and fear and improved abilities to show feelings and empathy. Neurohormones connected with aggressions are produced by an environment that is characterized by stress, fear, and aggression. These social environments are associated with lower levels of oxytocin and higher levels of vasopressin and cortisol, which are engendered negative emotions, hostility bias, antisocial behavior, and low social environment involvement. Neurocognitive models of severe antisocial behavior show that the amygdala dysfunction or higher hyperactivity to threat could partly exclude cortisol hyperactivity as, amyg as the amygdala effect, the HPA axis. Studies have argued that conduct disorder involved with reactive threat dri driven aggression shows overactivity in circuits connecting the amygdala, hypothalamus, and pituitary, pituitary pri prior actoductal prior gray. An article on women in prison with traumatic brain injury indicate that they experience more 
PTSD, major depression, bipolar disorder, and substance abuse. They also have anxiety and sleep difficulties. Men also have similar experiences. As I mentioned, 82% of inmates report reported past of trauma, traumatic brain injury. Brain injury induce executive induce, reduces executive functions and increase aggression and anger. Gordito and Morales 2007 studies conduct a systematic review and found reduced recidivism rates in incarceration series, serious criminal adolescents who have received cognitive behavioral treatment. In most adults' prisons and some youth prisons, however, rehabilitation and treatment are often absent and repressive control is the main concern. Rearing environment can have an effect on one's trauma prior to, prison, to their prison sentence. Suboptimal education, high unemployment rates, family discord, substance abuse, and domestic violence, high risk of childhood trauma and neglect. The lower the score, on the, the lower they score on a test, the higher the their uh, their behavior difficulties on prison behavior rating scales. Education levels were significantly dull confusion scales. Two cognitive functions were important in the association with prison behavior, attention and processing skills. Attention deficit have previously been reported in adults and children with problems in emotional regulations. Solitary confinement is a uh, physically isolate is a place that physically isolates prisoners for 22 to 24 hours of a day. It is commonly referred to as isolation, lockdown, or segregation. Sometimes referred to as the box by prisoners. Limited human they have limited human interactions and access to stimuli. Solitary confinement has contributed to adverse psychological conditions because of the lack of human contacts including issues include, but are not limited to paranoia, hallucination, poor impulsive control, issues with memory, attention and concentration, worsen pre-existing mental health conditions. Two examples of people who have experienced solitary confinement are Khalif Broder and Corey Wise. Khalif Broder was arrested at 16 and could not afford bail through his time of incarceration. He was falsely convicted of robbery of a backpack and spent majority of time in solitary confinement. As you may know, social, social interaction is one of our basic needs according to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. He was tortured and beaten by guards and other inmates. He tried to kill himself multiple times during his prison sentence. After he was released, he put himself in a self-imposed solitary confinement and often spoke to objects in his room, for example, water bottles. Solitary confinement, as shown in Khalif Brado's case, cause severe physical and psychological harm, such as psychosis, trauma, severe depression, serious self-injury, and eventually suicide. Corey Wise is a member, a member of the, exec, the Exonerated Five who was falsely convicted of a crime but experienced trauma prior to and during his prison sentence. He had a learning disability and would often skip school. When he was convicted, he was sent to Rikers at 16 there he was severely beaten and tortured, causing further brain injury, now resulting in language and communication difficulty and further learning impairments. For collateral damage, um, 10 million people are affected, which I previously mentioned, and 5 million, 5 million, 5 million of those are children. Bell et al. 2018 studies hypothesized that children of convicted parents would be at increased risk of poor developmental outcomes compared to children of parents who have been incarcerated or, ser or served community orders. They examined physical health and well-being, social competence, emotional maturity, language, cognitive skills, and communication skill, and general knowledge. Results show that children with convicted parents were more de more, we're more likely to have developmental vulnerability and are at risk for physical, social, emotional, communicative, and cognitive development. Paternal, not paternal incarceration is linked to behavioral problems in children. Parents' gender was a predictor for mental health difficulties for the, the, for the children's experiences. Although it's not possible to conclude that parents' criminal activities cause children's poor outcomes, our results, their results reinforce the importance of recognizing the influence of, of family con 
texts in which these children's development, to, development is in, occurring. These risk factors not only put children at risk for cognitive impairment, but also at risk for entering the cycle of the criminal justice system. For some discussion questions, I want to know, do you think that neuroscience and mental health should be considered in the criminal justice system when determining prison sentence and what resources should be put in place for those that suffer from mental health issues or traumatic brain injury while incarcerated and after prison? Thank you, that was great, really important. <clears throat> I think I might've mentioned before, I'm actually working with the Innocence Project on a guy who had a traumatic brain injury before he committed his crime and that wasn't taken into account in his sentencing. Um, so I think this is super important and something that people are just, just, just beginning to look at. Um, so it's great that you did this. Um, any questions for Kira? All right, thanks again, really great. Um, okay, so, Oh shoot, I just see I spelled your name wrong on here. Sorry about that, Kira. Um, so who wants to go next? I can. Okay, thanks. Um, let's see, can you guys see my screen? Yep, but we see it in presenter mode. You know, we can see yep. the whole, okay. Yes. Okay, just wanted to make sure you could see it, period. <laughs> um, okay, still good? Still good. Okay, perfect. Um, so I'm doing my presentation on the connection between epilepsy and Alzheimer's disease. I first got interested in this at a internship I had at an Alzheimer's clinic. I was looking through patient uh, medical records for some research we were doing, and I noticed a lot more diagnoses of epilepsy than I thought there would be. So I decided to look into it a bit. So here is sort of what I found with more research. Um, so to start off, just some quick background on Alzheimer's disease or AD. Um, it is the most common form of dementia, about 70% of all dementia diagnoses of AD, although it's not required to have the pathology, of course. Um, there are several mutations that can occur in someone's genetics to have it, um, especially with the amyloid precursor protein or APP, which I will get into more. Um, that's not the only mutation, of course. Um, but it is the one that most is most relevant to this presentation. Um, and someone's risk for having Alzheimer's greatly increases with age. Um, and as you grow even older, that risk increases. Um, for example, someone's risk when they are 85 is about triple the risk when they are 65. Um, so as someone ages, that really increases. Um, here is the pathology of Alzheimer's, you can see here, um, is made up of tangles and plaques, most specifically. Um, so the neurofibrillary tangles are made up of tau, which is a protein that holds microtubules together in axons. And in AD, the tau changes and falls off of um, the microtubules, which results in these blue tangles here and that makes the microtubules not stay together as much. Um, and then for the plaques over here, these are made up of beta amyloid. Um, the beta amyloid are cleaved portions of the amyloid precursor protein that I mentioned a little while ago. Um, these have been cleaved at incorrect intervals, and so they're no longer soluble in the extracellular space, and they aggregate and they prevent communication between neurons. And as these plaques and tangles become more prevalent in the brain on Alzheimer's disease, neurons can start to die, leading to dysfunction in memory, judgment, executive function, and much, much more in Alzheimer's disease. And so what is epilepsy? Epilepsy is a predisposition to having seizures, which is abnormal, 
and which is abnormal and excessive neural activity. There are several possible mechanisms for having seizures, and these are by no means exclusive. Um, there can be more than this, or they could be combined. Um, one possible mecha mechanism is increased glutamate release, which results in increased excitatory transmission. There is also the possibility of decreased GABA, which lowers the amount of inhibitory transmission. Um, there is also a possibility of increased potassium and decreased calcium release. Um, this can also lead to seizures. And while these are the three main mechanisms of epilepsy, um, this cannot be narrowed down to just one and each individual can be different. Um, the drugs, they're anti-epileptic drugs or AEDs, they can each target like one specific mechanism and depending on the individual's um, epilepsy, different drugs can have different efficacies. And there are two main types of seizures, one being a focal or partial seizure and the other being generalized. Um, I have it over here with the EEGs as well. So here is a normal non-epileptic brain and it's normal EEG. And then I have with a partial or focal seizure, which is where it's concentrated in just one region of the brain, just one area. Um, and as you can see in the EEG, it is just like partially there. Um, for this, the symptoms will often be related to what brain area um, it's in. And then there's also generalized seizures, which go over both hemispheres of the brain. And you can see in the EEG, it sort of goes everywhere. And then for that, this typically results in a more severe reaction. And so how do epilepsy and Alzheimer's disease relate to each other? Um, I mean, they're both neurological diseases, obviously, but the um, concurrent diagnosis is actually much higher um, than one diagnosis in otherwise cognitive healthy, cognitively healthy adults. Um, so epilepsy, just straight epilepsy has about a 1% diagnosis rate in adults, whereas Alzheimer's is about 11% in older adults. However, having a diagnosis of epilepsy and then um, an additional diagnosis of Alzheimer's or vice versa, has a rate of about 10 to 38%, um, having the both of them together. And this is even more emphasized in familial AD, which has that genetic component, um, which um, rates of the diagnosis of epilepsy in addition to AD goes up to about 60%. Um, we're in early onset AD, which is diagnosis um, before 65 years old, that is about a 45% prevalence of the additional diagnosis of epilepsy. So the presentation of seizures in AD can actually be easily missed as they typically present as non-motor complex partial seizures. And this includes symptoms like amnestic spells, deja vu, arrested speech. Um, you can have staring spells, or unexplained emotions and sensory phenomena. Um, this can be masked by the cognitive symptoms of AD. And when EEGs are taken, although it's not too typical in AD, um, when they're taken, the epileptiform activity, which is a marker of epilepsy, is usually found in the hippocampus, the temporal lobe, and frontal lobe, um, when the individual also has Alzheimer's. And these are the areas of the brain most affected by AD pathology. So the effect of concurrent epilepsy on AD is a faster progression through the disease, um, especially found in attention and verbal fluency. So while memory is of course also affected, that was not significantly different from people who just had AD and no markers of epilepsy. So epilepsy can definitely have a negative effect on those who already have Alzheimer's disease. So to study the connection between AD and epilepsy, uh, you typically need EEGs and MEGs.
tendencies to show the epileptiform activity, which is best shown during sleep. Um, you can also scan for tau and beta amyloid pathology using specific PET scans. Um, and you can also look at a person's genetic code to see if they have the mutations, such as the APP I mentioned. Um, there's also others, such as presenilin or APOE4 alleles, um, and those commonly result in AD. Um, and there's also mouse models where you can manipulate those genes and look at how epilepsy affects it. Um, and there's a graph right here that shows the relation of the amyloid and tau pathology over time and how it progresses through cognitive impairment and eventually to Alzheimer's disease. And you can see how the increased epileptic activity um, is compared to the plaque and tangle formation. And sort of at the beginning of that epileptic activity is hyperactivation of the hippocampus. That sort of starts it all off. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that and how that relates to tau um, tangle formation in a minute. So one neural mechanism that both epilepsy and Alzheimer's share is the contribution of neuroinflammation to the worsening of each disease. Um, in addition, there's also temporal lobe epilepsy, which is specifically one of the most common forms of, of epilepsy. And that has been found to have increased expression of APP and increased tau aggregation. Um, and to show their connection pharmacologically, anti-epileptic anti-epileptic drugs or AEDs have been used in AD mouse models. And that shows that the symptoms of both epilepsy and the symptoms of Alzheimer's both decreased in addition to the pathology of AD. Um, however, we have not been able to use AEDs in humans and found any efficacy in that yet. Um, there is also excess tau in AD, remember that goes to tangles, and it has been found that that excess tau can stimulate the release of glutamate and that causes epilepsy. So you can see in this picture of the water maze, how mice with AD who have present tau, that excess tau, take a lot longer to find that submerged platform right here and they go over all quadrants of the water maze whereas mice that don't really have as much tau or not nearly as much excess tau can find that submerged platform a lot quicker and they're a lot more focused in their search. So that shows not only AD, but tau's influence on learning and memory within AD. So the main conclusions from this research is that uh, AEDs may, with Given with more research, um, be a disease modifying treatment for AD. That is especially relevant as there really aren't any valid disease modifying treatments um, that can be used throughout all stages of Alzheimer's disease currently. So the possibility of one that may be able to do it is really promising. Um, also having epilepsy in AD can greatly increase the rate of progression through the disease. So people should be carefully screened for epilepsy after a diagnosis of AD. That way um, they can have proper treatments such as AEDs if those are found to have efficacy. And they can also have a proper expectation of progression if you know having epilepsy as well is going to change their expectancy from seven years to three. That is you know, something patients should be aware of. Um, also, in the case of those already diagnosed with epilepsy, they should be mindful of their cognition and watch out for any changes in memory because they may be more susceptible to Alzheimer's or other dementias and cognitive impairment. So here are my discussion questions. Um, so in which way do you think the relationship between Alzheimer's disease and epilepsy goes. If you think that having AD pathology can lead to epilepsy, vice 
versa, um, if it's a bi-directional relationship or that another factor can cause both. Um, and why could it be that seizures in AD are more focal than generalized and that they could take place in the hippocampus, temporal lobe and frontal lobe rather than other places in the brain? Really interesting, thank you. So just important for us to remember, I wish I had thought about this when I was lecturing on AD in um, principal's class. So um, thanks, again, I'm gonna uh, skip over the questions just to make sure that everyone has a chance to um, speak, um, but we'll hold on to them in case we have time at the end. Thanks, Rachel. Um, who wants to go next? I can go. Thank you, Julian. All right, so um, I'm doing my presentation on um, anxiety and the connection to the gut brain axis. Um, so just to give an overview, I'm gonna um, provide some background um, and then I'm going to uh, talk more about the gut brain access. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about how anxiety sort of incorporates into that um, and then the effect of probiotics and a summary. Sorry. Um, so just some uh, background. Um, so we coexist with um, microbes, as we many of you probably already know. Um, they exist in many of um, our body regions, including our nose, our throat, our skin, um, and our gut. Um, our first sort of colonization um, occurs during and just after birth. Um, and then, uh, but that's sort of contested. Um, some scientists say that um, we're exposed to bacteria um, in the placenta, but I don't know, it's, it's new research, so people sort of go back and forth. Um, after birth, um, there are a lot of factors that sort of contribute to the composition of the microbiome. Um, some of the biggest ones are our diet, um, that if we use antibiotics or any other medications, um, our genetic makeup, um, and even factors like the number of people that you interact with, um, as well as if you have pets. Um, they research even found that um, children that live in rural versus urban environments have different um, bacteria. Um, and then into adulthood, um, the body will contain the same amount of microbial cells as human cells. Um, and this is a good thing because microbes actually protect us from pathogens and help us digest food. Um, the more diverse your microbiome, the better, can lead to um, a healthier metabolism. Um, and then a less diverse microbiome can have a whole host of problems. It's been associated with increased risk of obesity and type two diabetes, um, as well as um, mental health consequences, which is what this um, PowerPoint is about. Um, so just, um, an intro to some of the research, um, they found that mice that grew up in a germ-free environment actually showed increased uh, um, rates of stress reactivity. Um, so then to go into um, the actual gut-brain axis, um, this diagram shows both a healthy model and a um, sort of disease model. Um, in the healthy model, um, the brain will release um, sort of happiness molecules, as they say here, um, which are dopamine, serotonin, and melatonin. Um, mucus will carry this down to the gut. Um, and then if you have a di diverse diet, this will induce um, healthy microbial diversity. Um, and then sort of the bacteria will metabolize food within your gut, and this can help with serotonin um, production. And then the vagus nerve stimulates brain activity. Um, and so that's how the cycle goes. In the disease model, um, stress hormones are released and this can um, activate, this obviously leads to hormonal activation, um, but that can also lead to gut dysbiosis um, and increased um, gut permeability, um, which makes it so that the bacteria within your gut can actually leak into your bloodstream. Um, so not only just bacteria, but also bacterial metabolites um, and different molecules and this can then reach the brain and all of your brain, uh, all of your tissues. 
Um, so dysbiosis also ca causes inflammation and as well as neuroinflammation, which can um, obviously be bad for the brain. More specifically on anxiety in the gut, um, research has found um, this bi-directional communication between the um, brain and the gut. Um, again, dysbiosis and inflammation can lead to this leaky gut syndrome. Um, and increased blood brain perm, uh, barrier permeability, which makes you susceptible to um, sort of uh, the bacteria and the um, molecules that are um, dangerous for the brain, like endotoxins. Um, th this researcher also found that pro inflammatory cytokines um, led to HPA axis overstimulation um, due to um, cortisol and ACTH. Um, so, this obviously contributes to the stress response, which can uh, which is essential for um, depression and anxiety. Um, they also, another researcher found that stress induces micro, um, microbiota composition. Uh, composition. Um, so when um, the gut microbiota was altered, they found that um, plasticity um, occurred in the brain, in the serotonin, or serotonergic and the GABAergic signaling systems. Um, and more specifically, they found um, that lactobacillus and bifidobacterium um, were actually able to metabolize glutamate to produce GABA in um, essential um, brain regions responsible for anxiety. Um, and then for probiotics, um, I wanted to go over this because this has sort of been an area of contention. Um, this review went over uh, 21 different studies on um, research on the gut microbiome. And they found that 11 out of 21 studies um, actually found that the gut microbiome intervention strategy had a positive effect. Um, but what was also significant is um, the method that they used. So 14 of the studies used probiotics, as in just sort of like a pill, um, to, as an intervention strategy. And those only had a 36% effectiveness, uh, effectiveness rate, whereas six actually used non-probiotic interventions, um, such as dietary intervention, and that had a much higher effective, effectiveness rate of 86%. So that shows that um, diet is a much um, more effective way to go. So then just to provide a summary, um, the gut-brain axis can influence um, mood and symptoms of anxiety and depression and um, mental health disorders. Um, that's not to say that um, medication should go out the window. Um, there, it's supposed to be more of a dual approach with dietary intervention and anxiety medication. Um, and then I also wanted to go over um, some what some of the researchers said were important um, for a healthy gut um, microbiome. And the main thing was just having making sure you produce um, like a diverse amount of bacteria in your gut. Um, so that can be helped through probiotics, um, obviously. So fermented products like kombucha, um, sauerkraut, those sorts of things, which have active bacteria. And then also prebiotic foods. Um, so that can be like high fiber foods, such as fruits, vegetables, beans, whole grains, all the things we're supposed to be eating anyways. Um, and also what um, researchers said, which I thought was interesting, is these changes can actually be seen within a day of diet change. Um, Obviously to have the um, effects last, you need to maintain it, but I thought that was promising. So I just have a couple of discussion questions. Um, I know we probably don't have time, but um, I just wanted to ask you guys' opinion on this sort of research, what you thought of it in general. But thank you. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions or comments? And thanks for that last, last slide telling us um, what we should be eating. <laughs> but you said the studies, okay, so the pills didn't work very well, but actually changing your diet did, right? Yeah, basically they were saying that um, it's not as effective because taking a pill, you, your gut is already filled with bacteria. And so mm -hmm. if you're just taking a pill, it's, the bacteria is just gonna go straight through versus you're like creating your um, microbiome by your diet. Right, right, that makes sense. All right, thank you. So I think we have one more. I'm just looking at the list um, and the people who switched. Yeah, I, I can go. Okay, great, thanks.
Uh, can you see it? Yes, perfect. Okay, um, so I'm going to be presenting on the neuroscience behind aromatherapy and essential oils. Um, so the NIH defines aromatherapy as the use of essential oils from plants, such as flower, herbs, or trees, as a therapy to improve physical, mental, and spiritual well-being. Um, and essential oils are basically just these complex mixtures of odor compounds that are derived from these natural um, things like plants. Um, and they can typically be applied in one of three ways. Um, and so they can be applied through inhalation, such as with diffusers, um, by topically applying them to the skin, or a little bit less commonly uh, through drinking and through the digestive system. Um, so a lot of studies have been done uh, lately um, and have found that essential oils produce a lot of pharmacological responses in the nervous system, um, including things like antidepressant, anticonvulsive, um, effects. And because of this, essential oils have become uh, a really large topic of interest lately, um, and especially in regard to uh, helping tr with treating and reducing symptoms in certain mental illnesses, such as like depression, anxiety, and dementia. And so we're going to talk uh, first about the various effects that essential oils have on the central nervous system, and as well as looking at some of the studies done on neural activity itself. And then we're going to kind of switch to looking at some studies that have found um, therapeutic properties with anticonvulsant and dementia studies. Um, and just as a little like bit of background, um, essential oils have really been used for a really long time. Um, it's been, you know, documented through records that they've been used um, in ancient civilizations as forms of treatment, preventing uh, illnesses and treating them, and as well as um, they have also been used in religious ceremonies uh, to produce certain. Um, okay, so first we're just going to look at the effect um, essential oils have had on the central nervous system. Um, so a lot of studies have been conducted with uh, animal models to examine these like molecular pathways. Um, and there's a lot of evidence that essential oils can interact with um, the HPA access and the stress response, as well as various neurotransmitter systems. Um, so the study that um, I'm going to just briefly talk about with the HPA access has to do with frankincense. Um, and so the, in the study um, that they did, they used sleep deprived um, adult rats and they treated them with frankincense to evaluate um, how this would impact their sleep and wakefulness behaviors. And they found that uh, decreased, they found that frankincense decreased the levels of stress markers such as corticosterone, which is like uh, cortisol, but in rats. And that administration of the frankincense actually increased wakefulness. And so overall, they like concluded that frankincense was capable of creating a calming effect in these rats. Um, additional essential oils, uh, I can't exactly pronounce this name, but I think it's like Lang Lang, um, have been found to have similar calming effects. Um, and this is interacting with serotonin levels as well as decreasing um, glucocortical receptors. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah. Um, and so in these studies, they've seen that um, this essential oil has decreased alertness, um, but has increased calmness. And those are just like the pathways that they have talked about. Um, and then additional neurotransmitter systems that they've kind of different studies have looked into include the GABAergic and dopaminergic systems. Um, so oils such as bergamot and lavender have been found to activate uh, GABAergic um, system and then also have anxiolytic effects, so just like reducing anxiety. Um, additional research has found that there are actually like three main components of certain essential oils that tend to contribute to um, antidepressant and anti-anxiety effects. Um, and so they just found that these were consistent um, between several different types of oils. And this area of research is just um, of great interest right now because current therapies for a lot um, of these conditions, such as like benzodiazepines and SSRIs. Um, a lot of these drug treatments have numerous side effects and a lot of essential oils don't, um, as long as you're not really allergic to them, uh, they don't really have a ton of effects. And so being able to use these uh, in combination with other medicines or also as a, like holistic alternatives um, is really beneficial. And then lastly, um, they've also seen some evidence with the dopaminergic system uh, with 
oils such as rosemary and sage, which have actually been um, psychostimulants and have cognitive enhancing responses, which can also be uh, beneficial as well. Um, so in addition to kind of alterations in the molecular pathways, there have also been studies that have looked at the actual um, neural activity itself. Um, so in a study by Cho et al, um, neural activity was examined um, with the, this essential oil called Sanjo in, uh, which is extracted from jujube seeds, and um, it's used in Korean folk medicine. Um, and they were they found that fast alpha waves, um, which are typically responsible for like normal wakeful state, um, and have been found in other research to be associated with mindfulness and meditation as well, uh, were enhanced by fifty percent um, in the yeah uh, in the like experiment with the oil. Um, and so that just kind of suggests that this uh, oil uh, can improve psychological well-being and it can increase attention and relaxation. Um, and then another study by Liu et al. Um, used event-related uh, potentials to see the effect of essential oil. Um, and they actually used a blend that they uh, created, but they were examining it with selective attention. Um, and so they kind of just uh, looked into that using something called negative priming, which just uh, involves having a target and a distractor and you're told to respond to the target. And then they kind of just record the differences and increased um, errors in response times. What they found is that individuals responded quicker when exposed to the oil blend. And then they also noticed that um, an event related potential that's commonly used in attention called P300, um, they actually saw that they were reduced in the oil, the group that had the oil compared to the control that did not. Um, and so this could kind of be interpreted as it typically is with P300 that uh, less mental effort was needed to kind of complete the task. Um, and then they also saw stronger functional uh, connectivity during this task uh, with the essential oil group as well through synchronization in the frontal parietal areas. And so all of these kind of results just led them to conclude that um, this essential oil blend can improve performance in selective attention tasks. Um, okay, so moving a little bit in a different direction, um, essential oils have also been shown to have anti-convulsant properties. Um, so seizures, as you know, Rachel kind of uh, was talking about, they are a result of excessive neural activity, usually involved with excitatory neurotransmitter glutamate. Um, and so a couple of studies, I'll just go through like these two studies, but the study by Pathan et al. examined um, Safranol, which is a compound of um, saffron, and they used a mouse model with status elepticus, which is when there's a single seizure that lasts over five minutes. And they found that uh, in a dose-dependent um, manner, um, anti-convulsant activity um, changed, and they believe this was due to the activity that saffronol had on the GABA receptors. Um, and then kind of uh, with similar mechanisms, um, another study looked at the anticonvulsant effect of um, basal, um, and they found that it not only had a depressant effect on the central nervous system, um, which they saw through a decline in uh, spontane spontaneous activity and things like sedation, um, but they also saw that it increased uh, sleeping time and it increased the latency of convulsive episodes. So both of these studies really found that uh, the involvement of the essential oils with the GABA receptors resulted in their anticonvulsant properties. Um, and then lastly, I'm just going to touch a little bit about how um, essential oils and Alzheimer's slash dementia have kind of come into effect. So various um, essential oils have been found to have some neuroprotective effects. Um, several studies have really been done to examine the interactions between essential oils and uh, dementia. And research has shown that essential oils can have um, anti-radical and anti-cholinesterase potentials. And this is relevant towards treatment um, of Alzheimer's and dementia because um, inhibitors of acetylcholinesterase are currently used to manage uh, symptoms of Alzheimer's. Um, and then additionally, research has found that certain essential oils have anti-amyloid efficiency and so one study was looking into a component um, from ginger and they found that it had cellular protection against cytotoxicity and apoptosis. 
um, and that furthermore it suppressed uh, the amyloid beta and the creation of the reactive oxygen species. So that was just like overall um, like assisting as well. And then lastly, more another uh, area of research has looked into um, essential oils and their antioxidant properties. And a study found that lavender actually has um, significant antioxidant and anti apoptotic potentials. And they uh, examined this in the rat model of dementia. Um, so this is just like a, it's not exactly new, but there is a lot of work going on right now, just examining uh, different essential oils and how this like holistic uh, form of treatment can potentially um, benefit um, and assist with current therapies that are out there uh, for various mental illnesses. So. That was pretty much uh, my presentation. And I have uh, some discussion questions just about whether or not you guys have used essential oils um, for different things. Um, do you think it'll continue to expand in Western medicine and kind of open the gates towards more holistic approaches? And then additionally, I think this is kind of important to consider since um, essential oils has had a cultural relevancy, um, if there's any kind, if you believe there's any kind of cultural appropriation happening, um, probably particularly with certain types of essential oils um, and not necessarily all of them. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, I think that's an important question, especially if they were used for, you know, religious or spiritual purposes. Um, do you use them? Me? Yeah. Uh, yeah, my my mom's really into trying to do holistic medicine things. Mm -hmm. She's given me a lot of uh, oils. I get headaches and migraines a lot. So she's given me uh, oils that I usually uh, use with them and they do they, like kind of help. So, yeah. What what do you use for migraines? Um, it's not like a specific thing. It's like a it's like a migraine blend. I'm not actually sure. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know exactly, but <laughs> All right. Um, any other questions? All right, so I think, is that everybody that was gonna go today? Or is there someone else I'm, I'm sort of trying to scan the list and remember who was willing to move to next week? I think that's everyone for today, right? All right, so, um, Next week, we'll have the last presentations, which I'm excited about. I think it's at three o'clock on the 11th. Is that right? Whenever our final is scheduled. I'll send an invite out to everybody. Um, so, okay, so I think we have a couple of minutes. If people want to answer any of the questions that were posed or ask any questions of the speakers, that'd be fine. If not, that's okay too. Anyone have anything they want to add? Or do we just want to give it a rest? Um, I don't have so much of a question as I do just to comment um, about Evelyn. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I saw a lavender bush on campus yesterday where like I parked my car and like I grew up with a lavender bush like on our property and I decided to cut some just because it reminded me of home and so I have a really big vase in my room now full of lavender and just like because of your presentation and you know finals are coming up I'm really hoping for some of those Anxiolytic effects and just like decrease my anxiety. So I'm I'm hoping. <laughs> and I love the smell of lavender. So it's a win-win regardless. <laughs> Anyone else? All right. I will see you all on the 11th, and I will double check what time we're scheduled. I, I in my memory it's three o'clock, but I could be wrong whenever we're supposed to have a final for this class. All right, I'll see you all then. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.